Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming one of the great character actors of his time, and uh, my good friend Lori Jacobson uh, fixed it up. I will be welcoming Richard Hurd. You all know him as Wilhelm on Seinfeld, but that man has a great career beyond Seinfeld. He was on the classic sci-fi show V. He was in great movies like All the President's Men, Fist, The the China Syndrome, Private Benjamin, so many great movies, Trancers. I'm having him on the show today to talk about all of that stuff. And I can't wait. It's going to be just one of the biggest honors of my life. I thank Lori for fixing this up today. And I hope quarantine it doesn't have all you down and stuff. We all got to be optimistic and cheerful and be there for one another during this crazy time. Also, I'd like to say happy birthday to two Friday the 13th guests of mine, Lar Park Lincoln and Tiffany Helm. Happy birthday, ladies. Love you all. So, yeah, here is my interview with Richard Hurd. So, going back in time, I was reading that uh, you were sick as a child uh, with bone marrow cancer, which affected uh, the growth of your legs, and um, that uh, your mother's interest in music began your interest in performing. Is that, is that correct? I have what they call, you can find it, mm-hmm. osteo, O-S-T-E-O, osteomyelitis, I guess it's M-Y. L-I-T-I-S. I got it, osteomyelitis. Uh, I think I was in the fifth grade. And uh, they put me into Boston Children's Hospital for quite a while. Mm-hmm. And they, they took me out to school. And I'll tell you, it really had a heck of a name. It was called the, uh, the, uh, the Boston Children's School for Crippled and deformed children. Right. What a terrible name, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so I went, there, I went there for several years. Uh, so the difference is, when I got my illness, I was in the second grade, mm-hmm. and I, I wasn't able to go into the kind of the real world with public school till the sixth grade. So I spent uh, like four years out of the uh, regular uh, growing up and uh, school process. Mm-hmm. You you play drums. Mm. Yeah. The way that happened was uh, when I was in the um, in Boston, where I was brought up at a place called the Prince School. Uh, they had a fife and drum corps, mm-hmm. and uh, I wanted to. Uh, the march and the parade, you know, the fife and drum parade. Right. So they they had lessons, uh, the drum lessons. I think they were fifty cents for the hour. So you, you take the drum lessons, and I, you know, I started uh, doing the band stuff, and I loved it. And then I found a, a teacher in uh, Midtown Boston. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, in, a, in a drum store. Downstairs they had studios. So I would go to the, uh, you know, the, the teacher uh, and, uh, and study drums. And then I went from there to when I went to school, I uh, met up, you know, with a bunch of other musicians that were, you know, working in the school band and this and that. Mm-hmm. And we used to play on the weekend. Uh, you know, proms and weddings and, you know, we got 15, 20 rocks. It was not a big deal, but I had a beautiful set of traps, a slinger and drum. And so I, le- I continued to study. Mm-hmm. And somehow somebody directed me to, uh, they were doing a musical over at uh, some uh, floating mutual hall. Mm-hmm. Why didn't I go watch a if I could both sing, and I knew music. So I went over and, just, you know, I got ready for the audition. I did it, 
and I got the part. I sang uh, this thing. I sang two songs of that with the chorus, the chorus behind me. Mm -hmm. The old folks remember this. I sang uh, Red Sails in the Sunset. And uh, then I sang an old Western uh, uh, number in the show. And uh, from there, I met a lot of other actors and singers that were also doing community theater all over Boston. There was in every community, uh, Tommy, mm -hmm. and maybe in your community of Reading, they do the same thing. I'm sure they have community theater up there, don't they? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, so in, in every community, there, there are these places you can reach out to and you can go in and audition for plays and musicals. And that's how I started. And then I reached out the summer uh, and I went into a place and I auditioned. I got a summer stock apprentice contract where they paid you nothing. And you did all the work around the field. You cleaned it. You did this. You did that. Mm -hmm. And you cleaned backstage. You built the sets. You painted the sets. So you true. And then you you were in the crowd scene and stuff like that. And slowly you picked up little bits and pieces. And I kept my eye on everything. And uh, anybody that I could learn from, I asked if they would help me. And they were most helpful. Claude Rains and people like that. Oh, yeah. What, what? I was, Claude Rains was uh, one of the people that came through this theater, the Boston Summer Theater. You mm. had a question. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask you, what was Claude Rains like? Claude Rains was one of the nicest people I ever met in my life. He, uh, we were doing, he was doing a play. We were supposed to go to Broadway called Jezebel's Husband. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ben Bizarro was in it, too. Yeah. And it was going on the circuit to try it out, you know, try out. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used to get to do some of the, you know, the members of the uh, the apprentice staff. And uh, we would work on plays. And he came in early one night and he heard us. And we were working on some Shakespeare, uh, which he taught. He was also a teacher. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'll come in a little early and maybe help you fellows out as best I can. So they were there for about oh, 10 days, and he came in every day before performance, every night before performance, and he taught a small class. Mm -hmm. He was just such a, a nice man and an absolutely brilliant actor, brilliant actor. And his daughter wrote a wonderful book about him. You know, naturally her name would be on it if you're interested. Oh, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, a wonderful book, of course, under, if you just look under the name Rains, and I'm sure you'll come across, you know, that stuff on the uh, internet and so forth and so on. So yeah. then other people came through, and I was going to go to BU, but, and I, by that time I figured all the experience I could get, you know, in BU, I had already done community theater, I had apprentice. So I did something that broke my heart, really, because... Uh, I, I saw my drums, uh, which today are very, very rare, but I just, you know, just selling them. And I took the money, and that's what got me down to New York. And that's what uh, I was able to get the money, you know, to uh, pay my board. And uh, I studied down there with some of the finest people. You know, Bobby Lewis, uh, Sandy Meisner, Philip mm -hmm. Burton. Like that. Yeah. Studying just all the various areas, and I, you know, uh, also the last year I did the summer stock, mm -hmm. gave me a small a small part, and that gave me a, a credit, so I got a junior membership in Actors Equity Association. That was sixty three years ago. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that I got that. So I think it was around. No, no. It was around that time. I know it was 63 years ago because I was doing a show on the road at a different time. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, uh, I studied and I 
all the very good people and made the rounds, which means you look for work, you look for work, you look for work. And that's what I did. And I studied movement. I studied uh, voice singing. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, my, my class work as well. You, you even did um, On the Waterfront before it hit Broadway. Oh, yeah. We, the, the company that we were in, uh, Cleveland, uh, he was with us, too, Bud Schulberg. Mm -hmm. he, was with, he was with us for the whole six-week period of rehearsal. And he really didn't do a lot of work on the play, which he was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So the play was uh, very episodic. But... Uh, a friend of mine, I did in Cleveland, we were going to go to the Kennedy Center. Then I was going to go into Broadway as well. But it went to a friend of mine, and a dear actor who passed away recently, Kevin Conway. Mm -hmm. he, he did that part on Broadway. And uh, it, was a, it was a difficult experience because the work was so hard and it was so physical. And uh, we opened a brand new part of the Cleveland Playhouse. Mm -hmm. uh, with this particular play on the waterfront. And they gave us extra rehearsal time because they really wanted to do the final. It was a hell of an experience because um, it had 19 men, I think, and one woman. And the one gal was, uh, what's her name? Uh, what's her name? Uh, Kelly Curtis. Oh, yeah. Tony Curtis' his daughter. She played... Uh, she played the only woman uh, in that production. Mm -hmm. And there were 19 men, and they sent down the best uh, combat trainer from New York. They hired this guy to choreograph all the fights. Because we sure as hell did a lot of fighting in that thing. With chains and hooks and, you know, fists and so forth and so on. It wore you out, man. I don't know, Tommy. It wore out. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> uh, here I am. I'm still okay. What am I? How the hell am I now? I'm fine. I'll be 80. <laughs> I was born in 1932. I think that may be uh, like 87 this September. Yeah. Uh, well, you're... So that's what I've been doing all those years. I've been doing plays and films on uh, and, uh, you know, television series and fire away, ask more questions. Absolutely. So th was it a personal decision on your part that you were going to wait a while before you did on-camera work? I, well, no. The way that happened was uh, that was unusual. Uh, I was in the service from the I found out I was an actor. Mm-hmm. And then in the, the, the newsletter on the Post, which was Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland, they, it, there was a little thing that said, from grease paint to war paint. So they found me out. <laughs> so they were doing these little training films. So they started uh, using me for training films. And when I got out, the guy told me to get a hold of the this fellow of the Army Signal Corps, which was the old Paramount studio, but in New York, in Queens, there was a huge studio, and uh, they, they made training films. So I would uh, go out, I went out there and auditioned, and the money, Jesus, you know, off-Broadway was $45 a week at that time. You could buy coffee for a nickel. <laughs> and uh, the trans and also you make a phone call for a nickel. And uh, so I started making these training films, 60 bucks a day, which enabled me, you know, to pay the rent and blah, 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 blah. And I, you know, I got, uh, I was, uh, you know, uh, I did New York shows, I did uh, touring shows, I did summer stock shows. Uh, anything you know when you're young like that, young like that, you've got to take anything that they give you mm -hmm. because you have, you have to learn your craft. And uh, there aren't very many teachers left anymore. No. A lot of them don't know that, that teaching young actors something they don't know themselves. They don't have the background or the experience. 
So, uh, you know, you really have to. And it's, um, you know, uh, it, it, you gotta, you just got to keep looking at it. The, the nature of the business when you're young like that, you don't have an agent. Mm-hmm. Nobody is looking out for you. you got to go around and look for the work yourself. Right. Knock on doors, try to get a job in this, try to get an audition there. Every once in a while you got one. So I went in. Why? I couldn't get in. I wanted to read for all the president's men. Right. But I couldn't get an audition. So uh, all of a sudden I'm home one day, uh, and the casting director, uh, Jose Quintero, you know him, the director, and so forth. I've heard of him, yeah. He, he, he and Jason Robards, uh, we did all of the Eugene O'Neill plays on Broadway. Mm-hmm. And he had this great theater, and she called and she said, Richard, what are you doing for the next month? I said, well, I'm at Liberty, ha ha. She said, well, you may be in all the president's men. I'll call you back tomorrow. And the next thing I knew, they had hired me for all the president's men to play James McCord. And that came out of the blue. And my agent, you see, when well, you're selling something, the nature of selling is if, if they know about something, if they've heard about something. But at that particular time, anyone that was attached, and that's still a wonderful film, mm-hmm. to all the president's men, uh, they could get me auditions. And so they could get, it was easier for my agents at that time to be auditions. Now, I'll tell you where all of us, how young we were. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was, uh, when they finally came in on at the Watergate and fi- looking for us, and there was a cop, and he jumped up on top of a filing cabinet and said, freeze, God damn it, freeze. <laughs> and there was that part of Abraham, you know, later won an Academy Award. Right. So there are all of us folks, you know, anything you go into, Tommy, you don't go, you know, a lot of these actors today, they want to go in and be be working right away. And, uh, you know, they don't want to study. You know, like, if you were going to be a carpenter, you have to learn the basics of carpentry. You know, your hammers and your nails. And it's the same thing with acting, you know. Uh, your techniques, your inner life, your outer life. They just want to jump in. Sometimes they get lucky. And they get a job. But the main thing is, uh, up until the last 10 years, I always did a play, a small play every year, just to keep my myself in tune. You know what I'm saying? Right. <clears throat> you uh, People, actors, they do plays for the soul, you know, and they do um, movies and television for their pocketbook. That's the, the philosophy <laughs> I've heard. Yeah. So from that, so from that, all of that, they, uh, they brought me out, and uh, I did a, what did I do? The first thing I did was uh, a Wofford file. Yeah. We did that out here in California. <clears throat> I think we did that up north there a long time, <clears throat> up near Mount Whitney. It was beautiful. So I got filmed, and then from there... My agent had film, you know, so they they could look at me on, you know, on camera, see what I did. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I went back and forth and back and forth. I never really stayed in Hollywood that long. I was working. I'd work. I'd finish the job. I'd go back to uh, New York. So finally I was out here and I was doing something. I, I was going back to the Berkshire Theater Festival. Mm-hmm. To do um, Perfect for Death play the big night, a wonderful, wonderful uh, play to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had auditioned for this pilot called T.J. Hooker. And uh, I got all the way back there, and we went into rehearsal. And I got a call from my agent. He said, well, they're changing it a bit. They want to do six episodes, and they want you to play Bill Shatner's boss. So after I finished the play, I went back out to California, and they signed me to do the TV series T.J. Hooker. Mm-hmm. That's how that happened. You never know where it's coming from, Tommy. Yeah. 
<laughs> you never know. You, yeah, you never know. You just the hell never know. But the main thing is you just keep it. Some days the top, some days are easier. Mm -hmm. uh, you just get, the only thing is it's hard to really keep up with life on certain occasions. Sometimes it can be very tough. Mm -hmm. But actors, you get, they got to remember to get part-time jobs. They, you know, and it leaves their days free to look for work. They got to look for bus boys. And I tell them to go to bartender school or this and that. <laughs> but all those jobs now in New York and L.A. are basically taken. So how far do you have to travel? Do you get into San Francisco to see any plays or anything? Oh, yeah, I'm born and raised in San Francisco. Um, yeah, I mean, I used to go to theater there all the time, and I even participated in some, so I love going to the theater. What did, what did you do? I just volunteered concession stand, or I was an usher. Sure, yeah, yeah. Was it a community theater? Yeah, community theaters. We got so many of them out there. Well, you know, they have San Francisco. Uh, it is and was. A very good theater town. Very good theater town at one time. I don't know now. <clears throat> and Seattle is a very good theater town. Mm -hmm. So is Chicago. So when actors ask my advice, I tell them not to go to uh, New York and not to go to La La Land. <laughs> they, won't, they won't get any work. I say if you go to these towns and get a job, and you do a lot of community theater, at least when you land in New York, you'll have a resume. Yeah. Right now, you, you'll have nothing. I also tell them, when they have these people that say they're teaching, is to uh, check the person out online. If they worked in New York, on or off Broadway, who did they study with? Did they go to school at Carnegie Northwest? And where did they study? And uh, get, you know, get some references. You don't want to be walking in. These people charge a lot of money, too much money. Oh, yeah. Three, three and four and five hundred dollars, I think, it's a month they want. And it's a great way for them to steal money from young actors. I taught for a while, and I directed a bit, but I don't do any of that anymore. You need too much energy. You need patience and energy. You know, you get a little older and your reserve, you save the more important things, like continuing to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what, what uh, when did you, uh, were you always in San Francisco, and then you moved up to Reading, or what? Yeah, I, I left in 2017, uh, because my mother and I became destitute in 2013, and we just had nothing, thanks to my, my former stepfather. And so we were going through hard times, and then I had my accident, and then, um, then God um, threw us a bone, and we ended up here. Now, uh, God threw you a bone, bless your heart. You're one of the fortunate ones, and I'm sure of it. Uh, how are you doing? You getting what? What's your prognosis? Oh, everything is great. You know, um, everything. Thank God. Everything is way better than it was. You know, and I'm doing this podcast and just interviewing so many great actors and musicians and comedians. Who did you, you talk to? God, I, I, I couldn't even begin to tell you because I've got over 800 episodes. You are kidding me. Nope. You are kidding me. I'm, I'm a very lucky man. <laughs> 800? Yeah, but the, the list of actors and actors, you must speak to singers as well. S some singers, yes. Oh, my God. I mean... Man, that, that's a tremendous, um, and how many how many listeners do you have? Not enough, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, really. I'm just. Do you have a you have a five hundred, a thousand. I'm, I'm about five hundred ish. Yeah, I'm I'm just very lucky. Yeah. I'm just very lucky. Yeah, but there's a lot of work there. Yeah, Laurie Jacobson is a wonderful person. Yes, she is. Oh, my God. The people. I just wanted folks out there to know uh, I'm into my retirement years now, and my right. wife and I have been uh, cleaning out, you know, uh, the various causes where I have I have 
scripts from the various shows and films that I've done and uh, call sheets and uh, stuff like that and what I'm doing. Uh, my wife has been, what has she been doing? She's been putting them online. Mm-hmm. Because the kids don't want them, and anybody that comes in here when you're gone is going to dump it in the dumpster. Mm-hmm. And if anyone, you know, I can make a little pitch here, can I? So yeah. if anyone, you know, if anybody is interested in, you know, uh, purchasing a script or sending me an email about something they're interested in getting or a question or whatever, let me, right, uh, let me give you my email. Mm-hmm. My email is part hero. That's P A R T. That's the what I have. Yeah. Yeah. So would you? Oh, well, that'll go on the air. Part hero. Mm-hmm. Part hero at what was it again? Gmail. S B Z Hero. Yes. S B Z Hero. Yeah. So you know any of the shows that I've done, they can always they can look me up, and my website. What is it? www.richardherd.com. Right. If they just hit the button on the computer, I think I'm on like well over a hundred sites. They can find out or more than that. Mm-hmm. They can find out a little bit more than you know, than that about me. Or if they're interested in you know like purchasing a script or an autograph photo, mm-hmm. just send me an email. Let me know. You know, and uh, right. we'll have a conversation and see what we can do. Right. You did an episode of The Streets of San Francisco. Did anyone bring up to you that uh, you and Carl Malden look similar? Oh, yeah. That, that, that has happened quite a few times. And, of course, as an actor, you don't like that because uh, yeah. that only hurts your career. People, you know, people don't want... It was, it was weird that I even got into that. People don't want anybody in a film or a play that looks like a different person because it distracts from the central theme of the play of the person. Mm-hmm. So that was not a very helpful thing in any way. It was actually it was uh, uh, several. I lost several jobs that way. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. But you've more than made up for it, though. Like uh, you got to work with Stallone and Fist. China Syndrome. Yeah, I, I've done a, you know, I've done a lot of feature films. You know, as a character actor, I've been uh, fortunate. But I have to tell you, Tommy, it, it's hard work because an actor's job is not just acting. An actor's job is to get the job, and there are, there are so few jobs now that it's tough. And young people coming into this business. Years ago, things weren't as expensive. Mm-hmm. Putting on a play, or this or that, and uh, much less expensive off Broadway. When I came in, they paid you forty-five bucks a week on Broadway. Off Broadway, on Broadway, they paid you ninety, uh, and it cost like thirty thousand dollars to an off Broadway show. They're millions of dollars now, and the on Broadway plays are five, ten million dollars. Who the hell can afford that? And you know, everything is, and it's all the real estate and the building and doing this and doing that. And uh, it's very, very tough. And to get auditions today because with a limited number of jobs is a very tough situation for young people. The very, very one of the first jobs, you know, when you go into school and this that I had in New York, mm-hmm. and it was a great job, was. Um, I was a kind, an usher in Carnegie Hall, and it was just a great job, great music. And then there were a couple of the guy up there who uh, he somehow had gotten in Teamsters Union, so you know you could work, uh, do a job over the weekend and make enough money to cover your whole week and pay your rent. Mm-hmm. So he sent me down to a place where you shaped up. Just put your hand up, and then you said, "Get on the truck," and so you can work for a week. And I eventually ended up. I ended up with uh, my union card, you know, James Hopper. So I ended up with that. So when I did this, and that was all familiar to me. 
the beginning of the Teenage Mutant Journey and Jerry Harper. Mm-hmm. And that was a wonderful director, you know, Norman Jewish. One of the Frank, best. Wonderful actors in that, in that film as well. David Huffman, Peter Boyle. Rod Steiger. Oh, yeah, I did another one. Steiger, too, down in uh, Mexico. Uh, it had two names, it was called. Uh, Wolf Lake was one. Mm-hmm. And the other one was the Honor Guard. And uh, I got to know him very well, all four or five of us. It was a very distant location. There wasn't much to do. So we all became very dear friends. I ended up, you know, uh, we ended up keeping in touch. Yeah. And I think out of the only six of us in the picture, and there were only three of us left, and it was directed by a great Western director, uh, Tom Kennedy, mm-hmm. who worked for um, John Wayne. So it's, uh, you know, you need a lot of people. You work with a lot of people. You feel lucky. Mm-hmm. You them say, uh, the harder you work, the easier it gets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you're just got, you got to work. Who was the last person you went to? Um, yesterday, I uh, talked to uh, Kippy Robertson for the second time. Oh, yeah? Yeah. She's uh, a lot of fun, and uh, I like talking to her. Everything okay with with her? Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's always, she's always making me laugh. I make her laugh. And everything was great. Any more questions or anything I can help you with? Oh, absolutely. I wanted to ask you about uh, working with Goldie Hawn and Private Benjamin. Oh, that was just he's such a wonderful human being. Mm-hmm. It was a wonder, wonder, it wasn't a big part, but it was a good part. Uh, General Foley. Mm-hmm. She is such a, a good person, a good actress. The funny thing about that, too, that when I was in New York, I think the name of the director was Zeit. I was Zeit when I was thinking. And uh, when I was in New York, mm-hmm. he, he did, you know, uh, steady pictures, straight pictures. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, he, he did still for the magazines. So he'd give me a job once in a while, you know, paid 40 or 50 bucks. And then he started making commercials. Uh, he was hired, and he learned how to be a director. And then he started giving me work in commercials. Mm-hmm. Then he went out to California, and he became a director there. And he started giving me work in films. Amazing, huh? Mm-hmm. It is. Yeah, so, so that's the way it used to be. When you work for somebody and they like what you did, you know, they just always said, you know, get that guy Tommy Kovacs, get that guy Richard Hurd. Mm-hmm. We can use him this part and that. So, uh, that's life along the gypsies, Tommy. Who's your next guest coming up? <laughs> a sub actress um, named Jackie Neiman Jones, who did a uh, low budget horror movie in the late 60s. What, what's it called? It's called Mono's uh, The Hands of Fate. It's considered to be one of the worst movies of all time. Really? And, well, I also did a couple of Roger Corman films. You know, they were pretty. Yeah. The thing about Roger Corman, I always look at Look at all the people he gave work opportunities to. Oh, God, so many. Been, yeah, that might not have been the greatest... Uh, movies in the world, but it gave somebody work and, you know, yeah, directors and actors and production managers. Oh, so many directors he discovered. Uh, Martin Scorsese, Francis Coppola, James Cameron, Peter Bogdanovich, so many people. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and the, the actors, Jack Nicholson, did a Jack tremendous Nicholson. amount of work for him. Tremendous amount of work for him. Yeah. Well, if there's anything else I can answer, I'd be happy to answer. Otherwise, I'm going to go take a nap. Okay. I'm almost done. <laughs> okay. How does V come into your life? Oh, that was so much fun. And, uh, it was, uh, that was 
was, I was, you know, what happens when you're in the business for a while, mm -hmm. you don't have to audition. They just offer you a part, which is, it used to be that way with me. 50% of the work I got was offered to me. I'm going to take a sip or something. A little bit of coffee, just a minute. Go ahead. So one day I got a call from my agent. He said they're doing this 10 hour sci fi uh, series. It's a wonderful part, and they want you for it. They wanted me for the part. And the guy that was the director and writer was my sister from Chester, my real lawyer, Ken Johnson. Mm -hmm. And also the guy that played one of the leads, uh, Mark Singer, a wonderful guy, very good actor. Yeah. So they, and, um, of course, Jane was on uh, Australia. But, um, you know, that was offered to me. I took it, and uh, it was, a, it was the, the biggest numbers of watchers that, at that time. I think it got 35% of the audience. Mm-hmm. And I had a full blown up in time. You've never been to New York, have you? Not yet. I lit up it the big thing. Well, right in the middle there with the ball drops, uh, I had a full length, uh, all these balls released of me, a full length, length replica of me as John the Supreme Commander. So anybody that passed through Times Square and looked up and say, oh my God, look at that guy. Some of them knew me and some of them did. But, and the people I worked with, I really enjoyed. And a bunch of us still keep in touch. Still keep in touch. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I might be interviewing Kenneth Johnson soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who would you be interviewing? Oh, Kenneth Johnson. Oh, yeah, he's a great guy. He's a great guy. If you, you are interviewing, say hello from... Um, your supreme commander. I sure will. I sure will. I have to get off now. They're waving at me. <laughs> really? They're waving at you? Yeah, my wife and uh, that's what we have to do. we got to work in the house. Okay. So I want to wish you the best. And when will this be uh, broadcast? Uh, late, later today. How, how many times do you do it? Uh, it depends. Uh, some days I do two or three. On um, some days, uh, on, on very lucky days, four. But I, I, I'm always constantly doing them, and I do constant research and everything. Now that must keep you busy. It does, you know. I mean, when you live up here in the countryside, there's really nothing to do except this, you know. But it must be beautiful up there, too. It, it, it can be beautiful, yes. Uh, it was raining and thunder lightning earlier today. That can be exciting. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, my friend, one day at a time, be well, and I, it was a pleasure having this interview with you. It was a pleasure talking to you too, Richard. You know, and I also want you to know yeah, I loved you in Trancers and on Seinfeld. Oh, yeah? Yes. Yeah, well, thank you very much. They were both very good jobs. And I like them. Really, yeah. Two very good projects. Two very good projects. You take care of yourself now, Tommy. You too, sir. Stay safe. God bless you and your wife, and have a great day. The very same right back to you, my man. Okay. Bye-bye, Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Richard Hurd. Ain't he a cool dude? Ah, very nice man, full of wisdom. I love talking to him. Thank you so much, Lori, for the connection. Um, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Till next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying... There's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.